His name is Patrick Solomon and he's director of the non-profit children rights group Molo Songololo, an NGO started 36 years ago in Cape Town. Molo Songololo works mainly with children from poor and rural families and one of its most important jobs is to protect children from sexual abuse, exploitation and trafficking. Hello, my name is Linda Fagisi and this is the journalist Midgog. This month's launch is Human Rights Month around the world. What, if anything, does this mean for our children in South Africa? Well, it means a lot. I'm like, um, it's not just of over 20 years of democracy in South Africa, and um, you know, so it's an opportunity for us to reflect on how far we've come to restore children's human human rights. And I think uh, also that's been one of the last piece of important legislation that we had to set in place, trying to dismantle apartheid laws, for example. So things like the constitution as it's got specific provisions for children, we've got the Children's Act, we've got a whole range of other pieces of legislation that has just uh, came into effect in recent, in recent years. So there's lots to celebrate. We are providing and realizing children's rights more and more. So that's good. And we also still have a lot of challenges. Okay, so it has, it has taken us a long time to actually realize that children also have rights which are as important as the ones adults have. So what would you say is the child, the number one child right that is threatened the most? I think it's difficult to say which one is more important, especially when it deals with children. Because all of their rights are important, which right? The so there's the provisional rights. And these are rights which, uh, that meet children's basic needs. Like, for example, a family life, right? Love and care, very important things for children, especially young children. Because those things are your foundation stuff. And then, of course, uh, uh, good health is very important. And things like the fact that children can go to a clinic, get immunization, um, that gives them a good start in life. And then, of course, um, you know, a, a family, a shelters, for, of course, is very important. A home, a decent home. And then uh, nutrition, food, very, very important. So those, those are your provisional rights. So they are fundamental for young children in particular. And, of course, for all people, um, for that matter. And then you've got your protection rights. Uh, this is to protect children from harm and also to protect children from people who might want to harm them or situations or processes or programs or, um, or even, even um, sort of, you know, the weather and a whole range of stuff. Those are your protection rights. So that's also very important because if you don't have uh, protection, right, sometimes um, um, you need protection from other persons, from adults, from other children. So those things are very important. And then, of course, uh, your participatory rights. Like adults, children have a right to participate, but we also know that children have an evolved capacity. So a baby might not be able to participate very effectively in decision-making processes, expressing their views, and say, telling us exactly how they feel and things like that. So parents obviously have to like to, you know, interpret what the child needs are, how the child feels, what the emotional state is, is the child in a, in a, a good, healthy state. And, but as children grow older, they develop capacity. And th this is an evolving capacity. So the older kids they become, and often when they uh, are teenagers, you know, that puberty stage, and then they start hating their parents and stuff like that. This basically they're asserting their participatory rights. They want to participate now. They want to, um, they express their opinions. They develop identity. They want to t tell their parents how they feel about how things are in the house. And this, you know, so those are the part participatory rights because adults, we sort of assume that this is automatic for adults. But we worked hard for, the, for these rights in South Africa. You know, the right to vote, for example, that's also a participatory right you know, and a political right. So for children, also, older children also have a right to participate. So it's your provisional rights, very, very important for children, you know, uh, for the, uh, particularly for their foundation phase. And then, of course, your, your protection rights are also e equally important because that protects children from harm. And then of course also your participatory rights. As children d evolve and develop, they need to participate. And often as adults, we deny them their participatory rights. So in other words, are you saying the participatory right is the most threatened of all these three rights? Um, I think within society, we still come to terms with participatory rights, particularly for young people and children, right? 
because we come from a tradition where children are supposed to be seen and not heard right and go play outside go play with your friends why are you here you're like you're too big for your shoes today we treat the child as an adult tomorrow we remind them that you're only 16 or 12 or, four or 10 years of age so they're very very confused um, our constitution um, identifies a child as a person under the age of 18 years of age but there's a lot, a lot of children that develop very quickly um, and therefore they assert themselves to be young adults and adults also through that whole process. So it's a very confusing period for them. So they often have conflict with their parents, within the community, with society about how do they exercise their participatory rights. So our country has quite a horrible record of crimes against children too many of us do terrible things to them and we read about it in the newspapers, the radio and television. So and we ask ourselves what is wrong with us as a nation? Wow, that's a big question. And um, I think the big problem that we have is that we l still live in a very fragmented society, a very damaged society and community. We still live very separate lives. People still don't know each other. And this is the environment that most children find themselves. Most black children live in these townships that was created under apartheid. And these townships also are ordinarily under-resourced. There's a lot of conflict in these townships. Stress levels are very, very high. There's social violence, interpersonal violence, domestic violence, and so and, and, law, um, and, and criminality, right? So that's the environment in which so most black children grow up in. And then of course also um, our, our children still don't integrate very effectively. Most black children still go to black schools and these schools ordinarily still struggle to, 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 to uh, move out of the apartheid uh, gutter education, for example. So um, life for children in South Africa is quite challenging. Most children uh, not only have, a, uh, have a, um, a threatening social environment, an environment that's quite unfriendly towards them, and then they also struggle to access resources, whether it's resources to, um, within their families or in the community or government resources. So that is um, the, the, the kind of challenges that children grow up in. We are also, I'm like, from my personal point of view, I'm quite often amazed at the resilience of children and of families that uh, they're able to survive with almost next to nothing. And I think in South Africa, the dominant views and the dominant economic frameworks do not quite realize how resilient uh, South Africans are and how re resilient parents are. That despite um, like, you know, this unfriendly environment where children live, they still flourish. We still have children that come through all of that, that manage to survive beautifully, that manage to get uh, a tertiary education, that manage to, to, to pull themselves out of uh, this unfriendly, uh, poverty-stricken environment, which, which often takes place in a, in a very violent um, sort of scenario. So there are many problems, uh, and I think we, it should give us all sleepless nights and with the State of the Nation, the recent State of the Nation address, for example, it was very disappointing that the President itself and the Presidency didn't send a very clear message in terms of how government or what government is trying to, to, to change to make it the better for our children. And um, we have made great advances to the social welfare support system, like the child grant, for example, foster care grant and all those kind of stuff. But that's not the only thing that children need. You know, they need to be in a safe environment. And um, we engage with children almost every day. And then a lot of these children fear being raped. They fear uh, um, like, you know, being stabbed, being robbed, being beaten up, being bullied every day. So that's their everyday life experiences. And um, so it's not a very, very good environment in which uh, they grow up in. So what can governments do to combat these appalling abuses? I think we, we, we do it quite a bit, um, but I think that um, we spend a lot of resources um, and that's good. We need to invest in children, but our results are not so very good. And I think what government needs to do is to develop a national program, right? A national program that everybody buys in, into. And that program should be about childcare and child protection. 
And, and I think if we can get to a point like that, where everybody, the first priority is child care, child protection, right, and education. And I think if those kind of combinations uh, can, can, can be just uh, put together correctly, I think we can make um, a difference. We haven't been able to make a big difference, for example, take Cape Town. And then you look at um, Kailicha. And now I've seen lots of good developments, infrastructure development in Cape Town. But when I look at Kailicha, it lags behind the infrastructure development. Why is that so? So there's kind of strategic decisions that we need to do on economic level, on social level, on political level, and, and, and also how do these things work together? And I think it's, it's a problem of government, that government works in silos, and they don't work together. We don't, at the moment, we don't have a national coordinating and accountability structure for children in South Africa. We, um, the Department of Women, Children, and Persons with Disability was set up and then it was disbanded um, last year by the President. And then children and, and disabled persons was moved to social de Department of Social Development. Department of Social Development don't really know what they're supposed to do in relation to the self trying to find their feet. But there's no mechanism that coordinate efforts for children. We still don't know how much money we spend on children today. The uh, Department of uh, Education say they spend X amount of money, but we really don't know how much money we spend. Department of Housing can't tell us how much money they spend on children, for example. A couple of years ago, Molo Sangolola started lobbying the NC government to establish the office of an ombudsman for children's rights. How was that going? Well, basically, we do believe that um, children need to get a champion. We need to have champions for children because their lives um, and the situation is such that they're still at the bottom of, 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 the, la of the ladder, right? So they need champions. They need champions in government, they need champions in civil society. And we believe that the whole concept of a children's ombudsperson can work for children in South Africa. This will be an independent body set up by an act of law, like for example the Human Rights Commission or the Gender Commission set up by an act of law and that gets the support, financial resource of government, but it is independent, it can pr to promote the rights of children, to encourage children's participation in public decision-making processes, to hold government account, and then of course also to advise government and, create, uh, and provide remedies for some of the challenges that's there. So we believe that is needed in South Africa. And um, we feel that an independent monitoring mechanism like an ombudsperson for children can ad help to advance the rights of children in South Africa, can help to protect the, um, the rights of children in South Africa. And um, so we have spoken to children and young people about this whole concept, for example. It's not a new concept. We talked about this whole thing about the child protector, for example, um, when we drafted the new constitution. And that's why we have the Western Cape uh, uh, Constitution have a provision for a children's protector in there because of that de debate. The KwaZulu Natal uh, Constitution also have a provision to create an, uh, a, a commissioner for children, right? So, so the idea has been there for a long time in South Africa. Other countries have established commissioners for children and protectors for children, for example. Um, some of them are completely independent. Some of them are based within the human rights instrument. Uh, the Human Rights Commission of South Africa has appointed um, a, a commissioner for children who is focused on children, but her mandate isn't broad. She does not have the resources to do what she's, uh, she at all within the uh, Human Rights Commission's framework. So we do believe that um, we need to have an independent um, um, uh, um, institution that can focus on children's issues 24-7, every day, every year, right? And that can also report to Parliament on the progress that we've made in civil society and in government on how we treat children and how we protect children and how we're providing for children. Okay. So how is Molo Songolelo commemorating Human Rights Day? We will be engaging with children, so we have some discussions and dialogues with children young people around their rights. We will also um, let them engage with some community leaders, for example, to express um, how they view the enjoyment and fulfillment of their rights. So we will be, have a number of dialogues. And of course also we will be engaging with key role players at national and international level. 
and engage on their platforms to put the agenda of to advance the rights of children basically. So tell me about some of your worst moments with Mullahs and Mullahs. The worst moments is money, right? Um, so I'm trying to struggle um, to get the money in. So the funding is, is a big challenge and a stress. But I think the worst moments is how do you cope dealing with all the horrors that children experience? And how do you cope with um, secondary trauma and dealing with those things? And, and, that, and I think um, it's also about how do you begin to um, move from one point um, you know, as someone who's experienced something really, really bad, how do you get that person to move from that point to, to a space where they can be, become fully functional, cope better, and also a, a deal with what uh, happened to them? In, um, you know? So that, those are the challenging stuff that we, we experience in Molo Songolola. So it is about you know, the struggle to survive that is quite sometimes very stressful. Uh, is there anything you would like to add before we talk about? Well, I think basically, and um, South Africa has come a long way. We still have lots um, um, to achieve for children. And I think the more we engage children and, and involve children in finding solutions, I think we'll be able to do a better job. What are some of your best moments of Mother Well, for us, is to um, experience this whole development from, movie, from a, um, an apartheid state to a more democratic uh, uh, government and how child rights have developed in that process, right? Today in South Africa, everybody's treated the same. Everybody's human dignity has been restored. So that is very good. And I think um, that's why we see people defending their rights, because they uh, believe that they have human dignity and the state and the community is protecting that human dignity. So that is very good. So even within the organization, um, when, we, of course, when we bring people together, it's good to see how people defend the, uh, the human, their human dignity and the human dignity of, of other people. So that's be, been very good. I think also the other thing that's very, very important is that, um, you know, just the integration of people. You know, that is happening, although we, uh, we can do much better uh, than that, but we're beginning to get to know each other. We, we've got a, a very diverse, um, you know, um, society. But we're beginning to, 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 to get to know each other better. And also we, we begin to um, work better together. So this, um, and also what I also like about South Africans, South Africans, we are very vocal about our issues. So children are beginning to speak out, our youth are speaking out, and adults are speaking out. You know, and then what we often see as like, you know, uh, public protests, is because people are vocal about this stuff. If, you know, if they don't, not suffer, they then mobilize to express how they feel. And um, so that's what um, is good. Um, and then of course the last thing that, that is also very good is that I find that um, you know, just the ability and the, having the space to feel free, you know, free to, to in engage, free to, 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 to move around for example, free to, to believe that it, it is possible for you, uh, free to access opportunities. And I think that's good. And I think that's kind of place in which our children are more and more of our children are beginning to grow up in and I'm sure that in 20 years time from now that South Africa will be a much better place than it was in 94 and now in 2015 so in 20 years I hope I can still be around probably very old and grey but yeah and I think um, I will look back um, in another 20 years and um, I'm gonna be sort of uh, yeah very very happy <laughs> That was our guest, Patrick Solomons, director of Cape Town-based NGO, Molo Songololo. My name is Linda Fekisi, and this is the journalist, Nikok.